Abrevo figaro, bravo bravissimo, abrevo figaro, bravo bravissimo. A te fortuna, a te fortuna, a te fortuna, non mancherà. La 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 la. A te fortuna, a te fortuna, a te fortuna, non mancherà. Mrs. Doubtfire is a classic 90s comedy which stars Robin Williams as voiceover actor Daniel Hillard. Daniel morally objects to the main character smoking a cigarette, so he quits. If you leave, you're not coming back in. And then I've got to do what I've got to do. In the words of Porky Pig, Piss off, Lou. I think all of us would love to have Robin Williams' stream of consciousness quick wit when quitting a job. But if I ever quit a job, I'd probably say something like, Hey, Jeff, you know what the monkey did with the peanut? That's what you can do, buster! And I'd storm off quickly before I could hear him laughing and saying, What the hell was that? And since Daniel has ample free time now, he's able to surprise his kids Lydia, Chris, and Natalie by picking them up from school. I got off early. You mean you got fired. Oh, man. His kids know that he can't hold down a job. That's not good. Congratulations on your 12th birthday. Got a surprise for you. A stripper? Ooh, please. Two strippers? Ah, <gasps> oh, boy! A party? Yes! With three strippers. Daniel's wife Miranda said that Chris couldn't have a birthday party because of his report card. But Daniel surprises him with one while Miranda's at work anyways. And this party is an all-out child rager. Daniel gets narked on by his uppity neighbor, but honestly, there's no way for him to do all this and hide the evidence in just a few hours. Miranda leaves work and races home, and we learn who the boss is in this relationship. This dude didn't even care that the cops were called on him, and he is scared shitless of this woman. You're home a little early. I, I was gonna have everything cleaned up before you got home. Uh, Daniel, you had a donkey walking around your place. She would have known. You're not getting that smell out in an afternoon. If I eat Taco Bell in my house, everyone knows about it for hours after. Oh, that's great. She called you and you bust the birthday party. That's great. Don't you dare make me out to be the monster here, Daniel. Don't you dare. And like, forget about everything else. What about the fact that Daniel planned a party for his 12-year-old son and had no intention of letting the boy's mother know? That is some psychotic shit. Oh, you chose the career, Miss I Taylor. have no choices here, Daniel. I have no choices. And Sally Field and Robin Williams are so good in this scene that it gives me anxiety to this day. Every time oh, I don't get such a oh, lighten up, will you? Like, I 100% believe that they are a married couple in the final moments of their marriage. Just realize you're spending too much time with those corporate clones you used to despise. I spend too much time with you, Daniel. It's over. Is anyone else sweating uncontrollably right now? Miranda says that she wants a divorce, and honestly, I feel better for everyone. We've only known these characters for a few minutes, but you can tell this was a long time coming. But bonus, now he doesn't have to tell her that he lost his job. Saving face in front of your wife. At the custody hearing, the judge awards sole custody of the children to Miranda, and Daniel has visitation rights every Saturday, and he's appointed a court liaison. And if he can get a job and maintain a house for three months, then they might reconsider visitation. So Miranda makes Daniel move out, and the kids are very upset, and... Jesus, look at the size of that place. You can't let Daniel camp out in the laundry room or something. You know, Then your kids don't suffer, they can still see their father, and you can still emasculate your husband. It's a win for everyone. Daniel meets his court liaison, Mrs. Selner, and it is very important that Daniel makes a good impression, because this woman controls whether or not he can regain joint custody of his children. I do voices. Yes! Yeah! We've come to this planet looking for intelligent life. Oops, we made a mistake. Oh no, Daniel, what are you doing? We're happy to be in America. Don't ask for a green card. <laughs> oh, Daniel, stop. I want you in the worst way. She is clearly not impressed. I do a great impression of a hot dog. <laughs> All right, that was a good one. Okay, Mrs. Selner, give it up a little. And so Daniel gets a job as a shipping clerk at a TV studio. It's meant to seem like demeaning work, but honestly, it doesn't seem like this dude micromanages at all or really cares about anything. So Daniel's basically his own boss. You don't have to talk to anybody? I would love that job. Miranda is a partner at a design firm, and her rich ex-boyfriend Stu Dunmire hires her for a renovation project he's working on. Stu is played by the literally impossible to imitate Pierce Brosnan. Ah, uh, and just look at him. You can tell right away he's gonna be a sleazy creep. Makes me sick. Ah uh, yes, you look incredibly beautiful, Miranda. I can't believe we lost touch all those years ago. So I hear you're back on the market, dearie. Oh, isn't that nice? Toy to toy toy toy. Farts! Uh, look, Adam, you don't have to do the Pierce Brosnan impression. Um, I kinda do, Daryl. The audience expects it. Okay, but it just seems to be getting much worse. You know what, Daryl? When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And I will do this accent until I get it right. Alright, fine. I don't give a shit. It's fucking guy. And so Daniel's first Saturday with his children doesn't go very well. Who is the old battle axe? I hate to think that she came down with amoebic dysentery and piles. <laughs> What's me big dysentery? It's some kind of infection in your tummy. We get diarrhea forever. Diarrhea forever? Body dries up and you die. Why would you want mommy to die? Good luck backpedaling your way out of that one. Like, she's young, and there's gonna be like five memories that she holds with her the rest of her life. That's gonna be one of them. Miranda shows up an hour early blaring on the horn for the kids, but Daniel yells and says that they're on his time. And then she barges in without knocking and shits all over his dumpy apartment. Oh, Daniel. 
charming. He works part-time as a shipping clerk, Miranda. He has to live in his hellhole because you kicked him out of his own house. Our children are not ready yet because you are an hour early. And you were an hour late dropping them off. Oh, and she robbed Daniel of two hours with his kids? Miranda is the worst. Miranda says that she's early because she still has to go to the newspaper to drop off an ad to be placed in tomorrow's classifieds. <laughs> what an old sentence. <laughs> oh my god. And Miranda's gonna pay the housekeeper $300 a week. And Daniel suggests that he watch them for a couple hours, but she shoots down that idea. Because she's kind of a bitch. And I mean, Daniel was shitting on their mother behind her back, which is never cool, but man, Miranda just sucks so much. Daniel changes the phone number on the ad and sends them on their way. And the next day he begins his reign of terror by prank calling Miranda, pretending to be people responding to the ad. My name is Ilsa Immelman, and I want to know how many children do you have? I don't work with the males, because I used to be one. It is just a who's who of weird 90s stereotypes. So Daniel finally drops the hammer and calls with a wholesome stereotype, a sweet old British nanny. I'm calling in regards to the ad I read in the paper. Miranda asks for her name and Daniel finds two random words in a newspaper article and calls himself Mrs. Doubtfire. Miranda wants to meet Mrs. Doubtfire and so Daniel has to have his brother help him deceive his wife so he can defy a court order and illegally see his children. And even though Mrs. Doubtfire is clearly supposed to be an old British lady, they try several disguises that would just never work. I mean, I know why they did it. You have to showcase Robin Williams' range, but I feel like they should have done this scene before he settled on the British accent. But they finally go the correct route and find a winner, but the fumes from the latex must have gotten to him and they all collapse. Oh no, I hope they're okay. So Mrs. Doubtfire goes to meet the family and she's perfectly charming and lovely, but Lydia wonders why Daniel can't just watch him for a couple hours. He would get a job and a decent apartment. You see, he's the kind... Excuse me, dear. I'm sure you normally would encourage the children to step out of the room before you verbally bash their father. Daniel's being kind of a hypocrite here. I mean, yeah, Miranda's bad-mouthing him in front of their kids, but I'm guessing she won't say anything as terrible as wishing that you diarrhea yourself to death. You remind me of someone. Don't look at me! I mean, I get that a lot, dear. Oh, if I had a buffalo nickel for every time someone said I reminded them of their estranged husband. Oh, look at me prattling on. But seriously, don't fucking look directly in my eyes. Daniel takes the bus back to his apartment and accidentally catfishes the sweet, lonely old bus driver. Hope you have something nice and warm to go home to. Daniel heads back to his apartment and runs into Mrs. Selner, who is there for an inspection, and so he has to pretend that Mrs. Doubtfire is Daniel's sister. They go upstairs, and Daniel has to be both of them to fool her, and he gets out of the Doubtfire costume, and then this awful woman says that she wants Mrs. Doubtfire to make her a cup of English tea. My sister's not yours. <laughs> you see, she's not a very good housekeeper, but she makes a fabulous cup of English tea. Really? Yes. Well, I would adore a good cup of English tea. The audacity of this broad. So Daniel is struggling to keep up the ruse and make this horrible person some tea when his Mrs. Doubtfire mask falls out the window and gets run over. Miss Hiller? Yes, dear? I take sugar in my tea. Oh, you do? You take sugar in your tea? Not even a please from this hateful woman? Tea right there with your tea. Hey, Daniel, don't forget the tea bag. Wink, wink. The water's boiling. As you can see, I can't stay with you, dear. I'm melting like a snow cone in Phoenix. There we go again. And like, I know this scene is played for laughs to put Daniel in a precarious situation, but imagine the sheer gall of this lady. Like, let's pretend Mrs. Doubtfire was a real person. She just got home late from her nanny position, changes into comfy clothes, and puts on her beauty mask, and then has to serve this old bag in her brother's home. And the whole time, this woman's acting like the quality of the tea will go into a report that determines if Daniel can see his children again. And Miranda sucks, but Mrs. Selner may be even worse. So Daniel settles into his role as Mrs. Doubtfire and proves to be a tough but fair disciplinarian. And Miranda comes home and is very impressed with how clean the house is and how amazing dinner looks. So Miranda can afford this whole house on her own and can afford to pay a nanny five days a week. And since no one is disputing how much Daniel loves his children, um, why wasn't he just a stay-at-home dad? So Mrs. Doubtfire's first day was overall a success, and she heads home and- Oh, no. I like that Mediterranean-looking woman. Natural. Healthy. That's the way God made you. He made me very special. He sure did. So is this bus driver just the most tragic figure in all of film? Like, he's clearly a widower, and he's in love with a woman who does not exist. The high point of his day is a few fleeting moments he has with his goddess, his muse, every day longing to hold her in love's sweet embrace. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bus Driver, but could you try to mount that large woman on your own time? I'd like to get home. We then get a montage showing Daniel settling into his role as Mrs. Doubtfire. He learns to cook, clean, and be a more attentive and responsible father. Hmm. Imagine if Daniel tried this hard when they were married. 
Oh, actually, that's the whole point of the movie. But still, imagine if he tried and cared. Mrs. Doubtfire goes to the house and finds Stu there, so she proceeds to vandalize his car and suggest that Stu has a small dick. You own that big, expensive car up there. Oh, dear, well, they say a man who has to buy a big car like that's trying to compensate for smaller genitals, is he? And Stu seems to be the only one even remotely suspicious of Mrs. Doubtfire. I have a home in London. I was born there. What part of England are you from? Accents a little kind of... Muddled. Really, Pierce Brosnan? You are the last person who can talk about having a muddled accent. You have an accent that makes certain beloved YouTube creators sound like idiots in front of their employees. I don't like that Mrs. Doubtfire implies that I have a small penis. It really hurts my feelings. Mrs. Doubtfire is watching their children when she goes to the bathroom and forgets to lock the door. And Chris walks in and sees Mrs. Doubtfire peeing standing up and recognizes his father's genitals immediately and the jig is up. You don't really like wearing that stuff, do you, Dad? I don't go to old lady bars or anything like that after work, you know? Although I may be dating a bus driver named Norman. It's been a very confusing few months. So he has the kids agree to keep this a secret from Miranda. What's one more lie to Miranda? Just throw it on the pile. The following day, Miranda says that she has an appointment with Mrs. Selner, and we find that Mrs. Selner told Miranda that Daniel has a woman living with him, claiming to be his sister. She says that Daniel has some woman living with him, pretending to be his sister. What a bitch. Like, is that even relevant that he's living with a woman? Miranda's dating someone, and I guarantee Mrs. Selner never bothered to tell Daniel about it. He's supposed to be older and very unattractive. Oh my god! I really think Mrs. Selner is overstepping her bounds as a court liaison. Gossipy hag. The next day, the whole family goes to Stu's country club to swim, while Mrs. Doubtfire drinks at the poolside bar. Not really sure why Mrs. Doubtfire even had to come along. Uh, who's Rugrats? Miranda Hillards. She's got an awful lot of baggage, though. Three kids. Oh, here we go. Here's where Daniel overhears Stu saying something horrible about Miranda and the kids and finally goes off on him and gets his family back. Three terrific kids, and I'm crazy about them. Oh. Oh, what about their real father? The guy's a loser. <laughs> I mean... He's not wrong. Daniel can't even be mad about that. And I gotta say, you cast Pierce Brosnan as the ex-boyfriend weaseling into his former girlfriend's life. I expect him to be at least a little scummy. Make this easier on us. Daniel asks Miranda to let him watch the kids after school, but she says that she can't get rid of Mrs. Doubtfire because she's the best thing that ever happened to him. And now Daniel has to research how to stage a fictional woman's death. And maybe try to figure out how to take a life insurance policy on a fake person. At work, Daniel stumbles upon the set of the Afternoon Dinosaur Show and pretends like he's the host and impresses the head of the studio, Mr. Lundy, the only way Robin Williams can by doing a rap. I'm a raptor, doing what I can, gonna eat everything till the appearance of man. <laughs> Iconic. Mr. Lundy is so impressed that he wants to sit down to dinner with Daniel to discuss his ideas for the show on Friday at 7 o'clock at Bridges Restaurant. Stu also wants to take the family and Mrs. Doubtfire to Bridges Restaurant Friday at 7, and Mrs. Doubtfire tries to get out of it, but they guilt her into going. Okay, Daniel, there is no way you can make this scenario work, so I think it's time to say goodbye to the old broad. Here's what I'm thinking. How about a boating accident for old Mrs. Doubtfire? Huh? And hell, Daniel can even pretend that he was there as a witness. Oh, Miranda was terrible. I saw your nanny go out on a boat and she was screaming, Oh, help me, I don't know the first thing about boating. And she just started floating away, yes. I screamed for someone to help, and along came a moyle who was lost on his way to a bris. And he was all like, Oi vey, young man, you're acting like a real schmendrick. And I was all like, there's a woman trapped on a boat, and some hip-hop teens strolled by who were all like, Yo, 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 it looks like that lady's boat is on fire. And a Southern Baptist preacher popped up out of the bushes and screamed, Be gone, devil boat, I'll banish you and your demon nanny straight to hell. And I was like, oh no, and then the boat exploded. It was quite a day, and then everyone left. You won't be hearing any more about Mrs. Doubtfire. So it's time for dinner, and he alternates between being Mrs. Doubtfire with his family and being Daniel with Mr. Lundy, and then he proceeds to get shit-faced with Mr. Lundy. On the way back to the table, Mrs. Doubtfire tries to murder Stu by putting cayenne pepper on his jambalaya, even though he's severely allergic. And Daniel's plan to eliminate his sexual rival is taking shape, but like a complete coward, he has second thoughts and goes to perform the Heimlich maneuver on Stu. And to prove why you should always just let your wife's current lover die, Daniel's Mrs. Doubtfire mask peels off and his secret is revealed. And since bad ideas tend to snowball and create more bad ideas, Daniel fires his lawyer and decides to act as his own attorney. In regards to my behavior, I can only plead insanity. Yeah, it's probably best to start planting that seed early. And so Daniel gives an impassioned plea that in any other movie would work, but Mrs. Doubtfire likes to keep it real, and the judge awards full custody to Miranda and orders a psych eval on Daniel. I don't do laundry, I don't do windows, I don't do carpet. I don't do bathtubs, I don't do toilets, and I don't do diapers. And in a final act of desperation, Daniel tries to get the nanny position with a new character. Gertrude von Wolf Emergency. He got the name from a newspaper article alluding to a deleted subplot about hyper-intelligent wolves that tried to take over San Francisco. Can you imagine if they would have kept that in? 
Miranda and the kids talk about how much they miss Mrs. Doubtfire when they hear her voice on the TV. Mrs. Doubtfire is now the host of her own show and she's teaching the kids about extinction. Miranda goes to see Daniel and tells him that she had the court order rescinded and he can now watch the kids after school, but they remain separated. Is there anything I could do to get my parents back together? Sincerely, Katie McCormick. Now, there are all sorts of different families, Katie. Some families have one mommy, some families have one daddy. And some children have a father who constantly is away on business for weeks at a time. And when you call him unexpectedly, he always speaks in hushed tones. And you can swear you hear children in the background because as it turns out, this father has a secret second family in Portland. And he loves that family more than yours because he bought them a new Xbox and told you that you need to play outside more. And then when that daddy dies, all of his horrible lies and deceits will come bubbling to the surface. And the shattered lives he will leave behind will be his eternal legacy. Oh, look at me prattling on. We've run out of time. So thanks for watching, and be sure to help support this channel by watching my 90s movie playlist. Just watch it and walk away if you have to. You know, just have it on in the background. And just have it on a constant loop every day, all day.